are going to take a quick break from 1 Timothy, as I mentioned, and just do a couple standalone sermons. I don't do these a, a lot, and even though they're topical, I still have a hard time getting away from doing a verse-by-verse -verse, uh, thing, if you will, uh, because then it just the, the Bible makes its own outline for me, and uh, it's easier for me to do it that way, and I think that's kind of the way that God would have us to preach the Bible anyways, right? Not just pull a verse out here and pull a verse out there and pull a verse out here or parts of it to try to make it say what I want the Bible to say. I think we should take the Bible as God wrote it and uh, teach it to you the way that God says it. Our sermon today, I think, though, is, is going to be hard for us to hear at, at, for some of it because I believe when it comes to my own human nature... Well, what is here written kind of goes against what my human nature wants to do. Um, and the, the title of my sermon, if you will, is The Christian's Response to Our World. And we can preach this sermon at any time, during any age, uh, because the world is going to be the world, right? And I think if you're like me, you're probably not happy with the things going on in the world. As a matter of fact, if, I, if you are happy with every single thing that's going on in the world, and everything in this world is going just as you think it should, and you planned it all out, you're probably lying to yourself, right? <laughs> or there's something really strange about you. Because I don't know a single person that is happy with every single aspect of what's going on around us. Uh, why is that? Well, that could be because of my sin, but it also can be because of the world's sin. As a believer, God has told us that the world is going to reject us. The world is going to reject what he did, and that's written all over in the Old Testament. And the New Testament fulfills that, tells us about that, how the world rejected Messiah, how the world completely missed the Messiah. So in our Bible, we are told to love. That's what the Bible says. We should be filled with the Spirit of God. We should love with agape love. And we're told to love. As a result, then, what is the world's response to the believer's love? It's hate, isn't it? That's what the world does to the believer's love. And Christ was our example of that. He came to this world. Why? Why? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So God sent his son into this world because he loved. And Christ loved. And he loved the Father. And he did the will of the Father, even though he didn't want to. And he died on the cross for our sins. But even though he loved with a perfect Love. What did the world do? <laughs> complete rejection, complete hate. And if you think about it logically, when Pilate is trying to release someone from jail to the people, he said, who will you take? Jesus, who was doing no wrong, <laughs> who's a good guy, on you know, Pilate's eyes, he was just basically a good guy, right? Or Barabbas. You know what that would be like? That would almost be like some well-known, wonderful man that basically has nothing against him but is in jail because the world has put him there. And a president or someone come out and say, who should we release? This really nice guy or you know, Jeffrey Dahmer or you know some other person that has committed some horrible, nasty, gross crime. Who do you want released back into your community? And everybody starts yelling, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer, let's take him, yeah, you know, have him kill some more of us and eat him. Doesn't make any sense. But that's what they did to Christ. Why? Because they hated with extreme passion to the point of lunacy. You have to be crazy to get that way. 
John 15, 25 says, Christ says, they hated me without a cause. Perfect, perfect love. And yet he was still hated. And so what should our response be? You go out into the world. You're kind to everybody. You're trying to fill yourself with the Holy Spirit at all times. When that person pulls out in front of you on Cannonsburg Road and you're going the speed limit 55 and the little blue hairs behind that car in front of you is going 35. How do you respond to that? You, you know, you get angry, you get mad. But instead of getting angry and mad, what do you do? You just say, well, you know what? God's teaching me patience. I'm going to love that person. And then what's even worse is you, if you honk at him and carry on a scene and then you both go to the same store. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of getting mad at them, you're driving behind them and you're treating them with love and you show up at the store and you do something kind for them. And you're out there doing all those things and yet they still reach out in hatred towards you. How dare they? I don't deserve it. I was doing nice things for them. I was treating them in kindness. They treat you bad. And for Christ, they hung him on the cross. You know what his response was? He loved even more. And he couldn't love anymore, but he still loved with agape love, which is giving love and expecting nothing in return. He gave, he gave, he gave, he gave. What is the believer's response to this world and everything going on around us? We're to love them. Really, Pastor, man, I, I, just, I, I can't do it. I'm not going to do it. Let's read some verses here in Luke in chapter 6. This is Jesus really um, reaching out to his disciples, the disciples that are around him. They're idle. And Jesus says, if we go all the way back to verse number 20, so I kind of want to bring in the whole picture, because I don't want to develop a sermon around something that I think or something I want to preach, which this isn't something I really necessarily want to preach, but I think it's good for us especially as elections are coming up, right? In Luke in chapter 6, in verse number 20, he says, And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples, that's Jesus, and he said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. You know, most of the people that Jesus had around him were very poor people. They weren't people that had a lot. They weren't people that, um, you know, uh, had all the nice fancy things. They were the poor. They were the needy. It's one of the reasons why they followed him around. Because he was feeding them. He was kind of taking care of them. He was healing them of their diseases. So he said, blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. They're more likely the ones that are going to become believers, right? Verse 21. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. What is he describing there? He's describing a lot of the early believers. They hardly had any money. They were spoken evil of. They, they were uh, cast aside. They, they said bad things about them for Christ's sake. It was basically saying, you know what? It's okay for people to do that to you here. Why are you even really that concerned about what people here are doing? <laughs> it's all right. Because in the end, you're going to have tremendous <laughs> eternal rewards. Great rewards for the believer. Verse 23 says, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Can you imagine that? Someone casts your name as evil, and you leap for joy. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a great response? You're walking down the down the road, and, and I don't know if you saw yesterday, like some kid was out reading his Bible out loud in front of everybody, and some group attacked him and took the Bible from him and tore the Bible apart and started eating it. Oh, that's really weird. I don't, I don't, mm -hmm. completely don't understand it, but that's what they did. Can you imagine if he just started jumping up and down and saying, "Yay! Great is my reward." <laughs> Be totally 
unexpected response, right? <coughs> That's what the Bible says to do, basically. Great is your reward in heaven. For in like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. It's the same type of thing that happened to the prophets. They were spoken ill of. They were spoken bad of. They're going to have a tremendous reward in heaven. Verse 24. And this is where it kind of turns on the negative side to those people. But woe unto you that are rich. For ye have received your consolation. Not very many rich people become believers. Guess what? Your reward is here on this earth. Woe unto you that are full. Those that can just eat and eat and eat and eat because they have all the food they ever want. For ye shall be hungry. Guess what? At some point in time, you're going to be hungry. Your spirit's going to be hungry. It'll always be hungry, and it's going to be hungry for eternity. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. Yeah, you'll mourn and weep in hell. Woe unto you, when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. You know who gets all the reward when it comes to churches and you know spiritual leaders here in America? There's many false teachers that have tremendously huge churches. Hundreds of thousands of people are listening to them every week. And everybody's saying great things about them. Guess what? There's their reward. They got it right here. For 50 years or whatever it is, they got it. Good for them, right? Because what does it say? Those false teachers, those false prophets, they're going to spend their eternity in the hottest places of hell, as the Bible describes it. So then it starts, after it talks about the believers, the Christian's view, they're bankrupt, they're hungry, they're sorrowful, they're persecuted. How should we react to those people then? In lieu of this, things are going to be tough, things are going to be hard, you don't have a whole lot, you're being persecuted. They seem to have everything. You know what? You're going to have your reward. They're going to get their reward. So how should you react to them? Should you reach out and say something like that to them? They treat you bad. They have their arrogance. And they treat you bad. And what are you supposed to say? Well, good for you. You're getting your reward. I'm getting mine for eternity. Ha ha. Is that how we react to them? Do we put them in their place? Do we stomp on them? Well, verse 27. But I say unto you, which hear. Basically, he's... If you're there, you can hear. <laughs> Even if you're deaf, he's still speaking to you, okay? <laughs> Love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. That's tough, isn't it? Who's your enemy? You probably have some. You might not think of people that way. There might be some people that you just, every time they come into your midst, you just can't hardly stand it. Someone that opposes you politically, someone that opposes you out in the open. Sometimes, and we get caught in it, I get caught in it sometimes too, and it, it's, you know, it's sinful on my part. Someone finally gets what's coming to them. Yeah! You've been doing that for years. You finally get it. Good. Glad he got it. He's going to jail. May he rot there. And I've even heard Christians say, I can't wait for that person to die because he's going to hell. May he just rot there. Because that's my nature, right? That's who I am as a human being. God says something different. Jesus says something different. Love your enemies. Do good to them which hate you. I'll get into that in a little while here and why we need to do that. But I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. That's not my nature. Verse 28. Bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. Now, if you've come to church here for any length of time, you know, from the pulpit, I prayed for Barack Obama. I prayed for Donald Trump. 
And we pray for Joe Biden, don't we? We do that. Why? One of them three are probably going to bother you, <laughs> if not two. Maybe all three bother you. I don't know. But the likelihood is you might look at them as an enemy. And how can we pray for them? Look at what they're doing to our nation. Look at the agendas they're pushing. It goes everything against the Bible says. How can we pray for them? The Bible tells us we need to. We should. Even if they despitefully use you. I don't like to be used. I don't like to be stomped on. I don't like to be lied to. But yet, he lays out a foundation here. Love them. Do good to them. Bless them. Pray for them. Verse 29. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. Okay, now this is kind of interesting. So the, the idea that people usually have when they read this is, you get in a fight, and they punch you, and you just say, oh, here, hit this one too. It's not what they're talking about, okay? <laughs> they are referencing something that happened back in those days. When you were what they would call unsynagogue, in other words, many of the Christians would become unsynagogued. That was the name that they used per se. And it simply meant you, you became a Christian, you went down and got baptized, you told the whole world, I'm a believer. And the, the church and, and the whole um, area did not like that, and they put you out of the church. But it meant much more than just being put out of the church. It, it meant being put out of everything that made your life easier at that point in time. If you went down to the market, guess what? They're not going to take your money. It was, it was against their beliefs to take the money of someone that had been unsynagogued or put out of the church. It made your life hard. And what, so one of the things that they would do traditionally, if you were unsynagogued, they would whip you. And they would give you a slap of humiliation. It was to humiliate you. Slap across the face. Everybody knew you were on synagogue now. So when he talks about when they slap you, don't get angry about it. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a persecution that you're enduring. They're doing nothing more than just trying to humiliate you to the nth degree. And you know what you're supposed to do? Just walk away. Take it on the other cheek. Offer that up too. I am doing this for Christ's sake. This does not mean, and it's not referencing, by the way, you commit some kind of sin. <laughs> you do something bad, and they whip you and slap you across the face to humiliate you. Well, you got what you deserve. This is talking about the person that's doing it for Christ. Doing it the right way. Turn the other cheek. And I'll tell you, I've tried before to just take it. When things aren't going my way, whether it's at work, whether it's in the church, <laughs> wherever it's at, to just take it and not give it back. That's a hard thing for me to do. That's what we're told to do. And then he says, in verse 29, And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy, cloak, that thy coat also. So, one of the ways that they would persecute a believer in those days, most people were super poor. If you were a believer, you were super poor. Been well established, right? You would have two things that they might take from you just to persecute you. You would basically have some clothing that might be kind of ragged, out of date, old. But then you would have like a cloak 
that you might use to cover up with at night to keep you warm. And you might have a coat that you would cover yourself up with during the day to keep warm. And they would persecute you by taking those two things away from you. Or one of those two things. Because it's hard to live life without those two things. Winter's coming up here. Can you imagine going through winter without a coat? Not very fun, is it? I know there's some of you that can't wait for winter to get here because when it's zero outside, you finally feel good. But most of us aren't that way. So he says here, listen, if they come up to persecute you and they take your coat off your back, don't fight them. Let them have it. Then if they go into your house and take that comforter that you have that's keeping you warm at night, don't permit, don't fight that. Let it go. That's, that's tough to do, isn't it? You start thinking about it this way, and you're like, that starts blowing my mind. So does that mean, Pastor Matt, that, you know, a burglar comes into my house, and I just start gathering all my things, say, here you go, here, oh, let's say, you forgot, I hid some gold over here. Here, take my gold too. Obviously not, right? What is this all referencing? Why are we acting this way? What is the deal? There is a mission field out there. We have a mission field right here in Cannonsburg. We have it in Rockford, all over Grand Rapids, all over the world, right? There are people that need the Lord. We're to reach out to them. We're to love them. They're our mission field. And what he's really getting down to in all of this is no matter who they are, they're persecuting you, they're hating you, and you can have some kind of relationship with them. You know what? It's better to give them the cloak off your back and keep ministering to them than it is to fight them about it. That's what he's really getting at. He's not talking about someone breaking into your house in the middle of the night, you know, holding you at knife point, holding you at gunpoint, and just letting them have their way. He's talking about a mission field here. And he's talking about our response because if we do nothing but fight them tooth and nail with everything, we can't have a mission field. One of the things that we've been talking about is our release time Bible class. I'm hoping this next week to get that all put back together. That's kind of the world, in a small way, persecuting us, right? Wanting to take away some of our rights. And we have lawyers, free lawyers, that will stand up and go to court, and they lose like that. And they lose big, and they lose fast. And we can swing that big club, can't we? And we can make schools back down. But what would be the purpose of that? What would be our testimony with that? Or we can figure it out <laughs> and work with them as they work with us and still be able to present the gospel to children. And then hopefully be able to show the adults that we are kind, loving <coughs> people who are reaching out to try to help the schools not to be a thorn in their sides. And maybe sometime down the road, we might be able to witness to some of those adults too, right? As they see us acting like a believer. Go on to a couple more verses. Verse 31. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. Treat them as you would want to be treated. You know what? We have our rights and we have our standards and we have the things that we believe in from the Bible. And we want people to respect that. And not persecute us for those things. Same thing should be the opposite way, right? It doesn't mean that we accept their sin. It doesn't mean that we accept their lifestyle. And let me tell you what, if there's ever an age where lifestyles have changed, <laughs> I mean, when they're starting to 
not even name children right now so that they can grow up and decide what their name is and you know who they are as a being and whatever we need to reach out to them in love don't we one of the things that happened this last week I'm not going to tell you where but um, one of our bus drivers took a field trip and then went to go use the restrooms and all the restrooms were gender neutral with a bunch of little kids So you go in, there's urinals and stalls, and any little kid can walk in oh. while you're doing a field trip. I let some authorities at our school know that, and I don't think we're going back there again. But it's, uh, they, they, they claim it's because they will lose their state funding if they don't do that. How do we react to that? <laughs> How do we respond to that? We do it in love, whatever our response is, right? And we do it in a way that we can still witness to those people. Sure, we can go vote, maybe change some things with a vote, but in the end, whatever God is doing, we still reach out in love. We still reach out in kindness. And we treat them as we would want them to treat us. And by the way, you know, the, uh, the, the lady that was kind of trying to explain it <laughs> to the bus driver, you know, it wasn't her fault, right? She's not the one that made the decision that this is how it's going to be. And, and we could have yelled and screamed at that person and said, what, what are you guys thinking? It, it's not that person, right? So many times when we go out, that person is just doing what they've been told. They're trying to be a good employee, and we take it out on them, and that's not how a believer acts. Treat them as we would want to be treated. Verse 32. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And that's kind of the point. We can get along great with those that believe everything we believe. Sinners do that. Sinners have a great time loving those that love them. The believer needs to love those that hate them. Verse 33. And if ye do, do good to them which do good unto you, what thank have ye? For sinners also even do the same. That's what sinners do. Someone does good to them, they do good to them. Someone does evil to them, they do evil to them. That's the world. We do good to those who do good to us, but we also need to do good to those who do evil to us. Oh, that's hard. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much gain. You lend without even hoping to get anything back. <laughs> if you do, bonus, right? When the church helps out, we try not to put any strings attached to it. If you give back, you give back. If not, we're just giving. We're not keeping accounts. We're not demanding we get back. We give not expecting anything back. And here's the end. Verse 35 and 36. But love ye your enemies. It's repeated. He means it. Do good and lend hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great. And ye shall be called the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. So here's the whole thing in a nutshell that we've been talking about. Christ loved the world hated. Christ gave more. The world murdered. Christ rose from the dead and extended eternal life to anybody that believes. Ultimate love. Died for everybody. And when you act that way, what those verses say, 
when you act in love and kindness regardless of what they do, and when you're merciful regardless of what the world does, you're acting like God. And you'll be called the children of the highest because that's how God acts. And when you're part of his family, you should act like God acts. Boy, that's tough. That's what we're called to do. That's a tough sermon to hear, isn't it? <laughs> now we need to go out and practice that, including myself. I struggle. There's a couple people at work I struggle with. And I don't want to do these things, but I'm going to do them. And it can only come through the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to do it on my own. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lesson that you gave. Father, we think of what Christ did. Perfect in every aspect. Perfect in love. When the world hated, he loved. When the world take, took, he gave. He loved an agape love, which is simply giving and never expecting anything in return, regardless of what they did to him. I pray, Lord, that as a believer, we can go out. We can show your love. We can show your kindness. We can be filled with your spirit. Father, when that anger wells up inside of me and I want to lash out because people don't know what they're talking about and people... Are, are just filled with anger and how dare they treat me that way. I pray, Lord, that we can remember these words, that we can love with agape love. And Father, as they're hating and we're loving, may that draw them to you as we become so much different than what this world is. Father, we ask these things in your name. Amen. We do have a... Closing song.